Nintendo Audio. A quick thanks before we start the show. Filmmaking Confidential, the book, is getting rave reviews from readers, filmmakers, film professors, and even people in creative fields other than filmmaking. I just want to say thank you to all of you who ordered it and for your support. If you haven't yet picked it up and you want to learn my filmmaking secrets, Filmmaking Confidential is for you. It's available wherever books are sold in most countries around the world. Order by visiting Audible or Amazon. To find out more, check out FilmmakingConfidential.com and SteveBalderson.com. Thank you. I'm Steve Balderson, and you're listening to the Filmmaking Confidential podcast. Each week, we meet with filmmakers, writers, actors, artists, and other notables. Many episodes include questions or commentary from other filmmakers listening to the conversation. Today's guest is legendary director Lloyd Kaufman, co-founder of Troma Entertainment. Troma is arguably the longest-running independent movie studio in North America, and it's one of the very few genuine brand names in the industry. Troma is world famous for producing and distributing classic films such as Kaufman's The Toxic Avenger, Trey Parker's Cannibal the Musical, Class of Newcomb High, and Tromeo and Juliet. Not to mention my first film, Pep Squad. I am superior to everyone, especially you and your fucked up, yeast infected, moldy face. At least my father doesn't teach piano lessons at the Catholic Church. Jerry, your father is a fucking gynecologist! You think that looking up cunts all day is any better? Scaratera! Strawberry shortcake. I challenge you to a fight. I dare you. Prom night. If you're not there, I will ruin you. You are no match for me, you fucking bitch! Troma is responsible for kickstarting the careers of some of the industry's biggest talents, including director J.J. Abrams, Billy Bob Thornton, Kevin Costner, Samuel L. Jackson, Marisa Tomei, James Gunn, and South Park creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone. With a library of a thousand films, cartoons, TV shows, and shorts, Lloyd isn't stopping anytime soon. His latest film, Hashtag Shakespeare's Shitstorm, an irreverent musical adaptation of The Tempest, marks the most ambitious project in Troma's 45-year history. There's a lot to talk about with you today, but I want to start with, what is this that I just saw about you being kicked off YouTube? We did get kicked the Troma channel on where we put all of our uh, movies for free. Uh, for some reason, out of nowhere, decided to kick us off, you know, that there's all this uh, horseshit about <laughs> about the content. And uh, so suddenly after, however, we, you know, it was at least a 10 year old channel with about 700, 800,000 uh, members and it's all free. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> they suddenly decided to throw us off. Um, the other thing is I did, I don't know if it has anything to do with it, but I uh, made a little uh, documentary about 10 minutes called uh, uh, Independent Artists versus uh, Corrupt Media Cartel, where I demonstrate how the, uh, the, um, uh, hey, Patty Pie, yeah. could, if you, can you look around up there? I might have left my blue glasses up there. I'm sorry, I'm on with Steve Bald. Say hello to Steve Bald Balderson, uh, hey. Pep, Mr. Pep Squad. Hey. Are you there yet? Hey. Can you see her? I Come see her. Down. Come closer. Come, come and say hello. We were all at the Cannes Film Festival. Hi. Hi. Pep Squad with the late uh, I know, Eric I know, Sherman. I know, I know yeah, yeah. Yes. You know Eric is dead, right? Stephen? Oh, him? yeah, of course. I spoke at a thing that they did for him at the Egyptian. Um, oh, that was nice. Yeah, he was so great. And you know what I felt the morning that he died? I felt like, uh, you know, that, that scene where Yoda reappears as the hologram? Yes. You know? Yep. It felt like Eric was there somehow oh. in like, you know, energy around or something. <laughs> um, it was a big influence on uh, all of our lives. Sorry, he, uh, it's ironic that he went first because uh, he was a vegetarian and uh, you know, went with all that California stuff about health. 
So you guys were friends at Yale. Yeah, he was next door, a freshman year, and a great guy, a good golfer, although I stopped playing golf. Um, he uh, uh, obviously was one of the stalwarts of the film society. And my roommate, Robert Edelstein, uh, was the head of the film society. And uh, so uh, they pretty much uh, are responsible for my uh, catching the, uh, the uh, movie uh, virus. Well, I was going to ask you about that because I thought he told me that you studied Chinese history. Chinese studies, right? yes, yes. And I kept thinking, well, how did you get from Chinese studies to film well robert was the film nut and we our beds were head to toe in uh, my uh, uh, uh in our uh, tiny little bedroom uh, in our yale suite there were two other roommates uh, next door uh, in the same suite we had a living room and two bedrooms uh, that uh, so robert and my bed were head to toe and at night i would inhale his uh, godard uh, stinking feet and uh the Aroma du Troma was born. I kept drifting into the Yale Film Society um, uh, looking for you know, dates. Uh, there were all men in those days. And uh, usually about three people in there because they were uh, auteur film uh, fanatics. And uh, I was heavily, I speak French. So the, uh, they, the office of Film Society had a large uh, pile of Cahiers de Cinema, which is the French uh, Cinematheque uh, magazine and and uh, Godard and uh, Truffaut and uh, and Chevrol were uh, transitioning from critic to uh, not to women but to uh, to uh, filmmakers and uh, <clears throat> so I read their stuff and um, and since the film society was heavy into auteur and uh, I'm extremely uh, se uh, sens I'm extremely susceptible to uh, any kind of uh, strong uh, <laughs> strong um, philosophy, I decided I would try to become that uh, type of filmmaker and control the, the brain, uh, you know, control the movies with the brain, heart, uh, and soul of uh, my being. And, uh, and that's that what led to uh, 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 my senior year, I had two job offers. One was to work on The Owl and the Pussycat uh, with Barbara Streisand. And which I think, may, no, I don't think it won any. I, I can't remember. And the other one was to work for a, a shitty little uh, independent company in New York City called Canon. And uh, I, I uh, spent a night in, alone in my mother's uh, house in New York City and uh, took some uh, acid and uh, came out of it deciding I'd stay in New York and become uh, the auteur uh, filmmaker. Well, and how long then did it take before you co-founded Troma? 1974, we started Troma. Uh, I got out of Yale in 69, a year later than uh, Robert Edelstein and, uh, and uh, Eric Sherman. And uh, I, uh, I had made two movies with Robert uh, at Yale, two feature length movies, uh, both unwatchable. Um, the Troma team has put one of them up on the Troma channel to embarrass me. And, uh, uh, but it's black and white. A shot with a Bolex, uh, no sync sound because the Bolex does not have a sync pulse. So it's just uh, like a silent movie with narration, music, and a few uh, voice and special effect moments. So it's, a, it's, it's a basically, but we did send it around to colleges <laughs> and uh, made uh, the uh, Harvard and the, I think, oh yeah, Harvard, Columbia, two or three others in the Ivy League thanks to Robert, uh, played the film and I, we charged a dollar and, and uh, nobody burned down the seats. And then there were a few other colleges around the country that uh, booked it. So, uh, you, know, I, you know, at least it was a good experience. And then uh, I made Battle of Love's Return, uh, 1970, and I started working for Canon. Uh, and then uh, I started a company with two older guys and all I had to do was raise the money and they did, they would do all the rest and we'd make millions of dollars, but they both turned out to be uh, uh, subpar. Uh, so uh, uh, we made uh, two films and the other guy, the other two started fighting. And uh, so uh, Oliver Stone was part of that the group. Uh, we made a movie called Sugar Cookies, which was uh, our version. Uh, I wrote the script. It was uh, my uh, take on uh, Vertigo and Ted Gershuni took what I wrote 
and he rewrote it and did a good job, except he made it more boring. And he was married to um, Mary Warren of at the time. So she and Lynn Lowry, who I uh, discovered in, uh, Lynn Lowry is, this, actually Mary and Lynn both did horror films. Uh, Lynn was in Battle of Love's Return and later was in Romero's uh, Codename Trixie, it was called. It later had another title. And then uh, I got suckered in uh, to, uh, by, the, uh, by the partner who was left in Armour Films. He and Gershony had a fight, so Gershony left. And then the guy who, uh, who the uh, Ami Artsy, the producer, uh, had, uh, he was an Israeli producer and was hooked in with um, uh, Menachem Golan. Uh, who uh, eventually took over Canon? Not at that time, but later on, uh, he and his uh, cousin Yoram Globus uh, almost got to the point where they bought uh, uh, MGM. They had built this amazing house of cards, which uh, they took. Uh, Canon had died after I left, of course, and uh, Menachem Golan bought what was left of it, which was a public company, if I remember correctly, with, with worthless stock, and they built it up to a big deal. And um, they uh, almost took over MGM until it all crashed down. Uh, so they, uh, uh, we made a movie with them, uh, Artsy, Emmy Artsy and I, um, and we had a small interest in that one, uh, which Gershney directed. And then um, Armour made the sugar cookies and uh, Artsy, uh, after Gershney left, Artsy uh, convinced me to uh, make with that with Menachem Golan that if you made a movie in Israel, you'd uh, easily get your money back. You every Israeli sees is his sees Israeli movies six times, and uh, we would have two negatives: one in uh, Hebrew and then one in English, where the Hebrew people would be uh, speaking English. And uh, the film was unwatchable, and it was the worst thing that happened to Israel. It was called Big Gus, What's the Fuss? And uh, probably was the worst thing that happened to Jews since Mein Kampf and a total disaster. Uh, and it opened in Israel on the first day of the uh, Seven Day War. So even there, at, uh, while the bombs were dropping outside the theater, uh, we were presenting a bomb inside the theater. So that was the end of, uh, my, of uh, Armor Films. And then uh, Michael Hers and I... Uh, Michael Harris had joined, had kind of joined us. He was in law school and he kind of helped us out. You started a company where you could make, produce, distribute your own work. And you were have been successful at doing that more so than anybody else on earth. In and history, I, I, think, I think in the history of mankind, of, of, uh, of their kind. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. How did you know to do it? How did you know to just or, or was it a path you just started going down and it, it evolved? Well, that's a great question. That's a really good question because <clears throat> because of uh, uh, Robert Edelstein uh, uh, and and Sherman too. Uh, the uh, I was set on the and my good friend LSD. I was set on the auteur uh, track. So um, you know, I stayed in New York, but uh, thanks to the Yale Film Society, I saw some of the uh, Roger Corman movies which made it clear that one could make low budget movies with good scripts, provocative uh, themes and uh, pretty good uh, unknown actors. And uh, of course in, in, in Los Angeles, there's a much bigger uh, opportunity uh, and the, the, the people in Los Angeles are much more interested in, in becoming movie stars and whatever. And they do become uh, big time. In New York, they're not, that track has not led to, although we've discovered Samuel Jackson, South Park. In fact, Oliver Stone, with whom I grew up, I grew up from second grade and who did go to Yale, he was involved in my first two movies. And he actually wanted to set up a company with me. Uh, I remember at the Yale Club, we were in the pool together and he proposed that uh, he, he hated the two guys from, uh, that I had, the two older guys that I had uh, joined. And he suggested that he and I form a movie a company, and uh, we, but he was too crazy for me. And it was before he became uh, one of America's greatest uh, directors, which indeed he has. He'd be impossible to work with. Uh, he was a nut. From second grade, we used to have sleepovers and he just, oh, they were basically him beating me up and I'd walk home in my bathrobe crying. So <laughs> until I got big enough to not, you know, sort of, you know, get, you know then, then there was, he stopped doing that, but he's a tough guy.
was the business plan all along to sort of kind of model yourself after Corman? I think that uh, American International Pictures was sort of what, what, what I held out because there were good movies coming out of it. Uh, they kept their noses clean. Uh, and they, uh, Corman, his, I, all his movies were very good. So I, I think that's really uh, had a lot to do with it. But, um, you know, I, for the first 10 or 20 years, I, uh, and I'm still doing it. Uh, I steep myself in the great American, uh, well, not just the great American, but at the Film Society, I kept getting blown away by, uh, uh, not, Corman didn't blow me away as much as Howard Hawks or John Ford or Samuel Fuller or, or um, Jean Renoir or Fritz Lang or Stan Brackage, of course who uh, out of Colorado, the uh, experimental filmmaker, he, uh, we brought him to Yale, actually, and uh, he presented the art of vision. Uh, uh, and uh, it was a great guy. And I stayed, for, I, I, I can't say I was a friend, but we were, we were in touch with each other for many years. And uh, he also uh, was one of the reasons I, I, I applied for the Yale radio station. They call it Healing. And uh, I had gotten them, Stan Bra I interviewed Stan Brackage, Lillian Gish and uh, Montgomery Clift, but uh, I was too much of a wise guy and they, uh, I was the only one out of 30 healers who they did not accept. They said I had a bad attitude. So, uh, <laughs> and I think the Stan, Brackage, <laughs> the Stan Brackage interview, which went on for an hour, I asked him one question and he talked for an hour, but it was pure, <laughs> pure gold, but I was the only one who thought so. Legendary director, Lloyd Kaufman. Another great guest of Filmmaking Confidential is The Enigma. Being part of the Lollapalooza Sideshow, which at that point, you know, Lollapalooza was an amazing thing, 92, it should have been called the William Morris Agency Sideshow because they're the ones that put us all around the world. And I became the most famous tattooed man in history because of that. I remember we, played, we opened for Nine Inch Nails in, in Madison Square Garden, two sold out nights. And, you know, I stayed in a squat <laughs> in the freezing cold. You can get a link to my full interview with The Enigma at filmmakingconfidential.com or by subscribing for free to this podcast. When we come back, Lloyd explains what led to his desire to avoid the mainstream altogether. Stay with us. I'm Steve Balderson, and this is the Filmmaking Confidential Podcast. I'm back with Lloyd Kaufman. My favorite Hitchcock is Marnie, uh, uh, but uh, that's pretty... Actually, Marnie's coming way up. See, that's why the critics... And I don't like to be a judge. I get asked to be on uh, judging committees for these genre film festivals, and I don't care for it because I don't really think art should be judged. I'm a perfect example of it. <laughs> Even even the faint praise, you know, I get a lot of backhanded praise, uh, but they still use Schlockmeister and uh, and uh, you know that kind of stuff, which puts me in with Ed Wood and all and uh, all those guys. And so uh, you know, I, I feel bad about trying to judge art. I think the movies that we have produced and that other that, that other people have directed, um, I do judge uh, because we uh, uh, we make uh, good movies. Uh, I'm, I'm producing three movies now that I know will be good, but um, you know they're probably not going to get accepted by the, Sun, the, the Sundance uh, Film Festival who, because uh, you know they worship at the shrine of uh, Harvey Weinstein and uh, uh, all these other mainstream sick bastards. You know. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so but I, you're... Do, I would prefer Vertigo at this point to Citizen Kane, although uh, uh, Sugar Cookies was a redo. A vertigo, lesbian redo of vertigo, and uh, which Gershon he made uh, good, he, he made my script into a good one, but unfortunately it's it, and it was X rated um, with Mary Warnov and Lynn Lowry, and uh, I used some of the uh, Warhol people I had met earlier, uh, and I think Mary uh, Mary uh, yeah Mary got us on Dean, and Oliver Stone got us Monique Van Voren, but unfortunately Gershon's style was very slow and ponderous. And uh, I should have directed it since I raised all the money for it. Big mistake. Okay, let's talk a little bit about marketing because in my book, I have that chapter that I'm talking about us versus the big boys. 
You your, know, your and book is great. I really enjoyed it. I've tweeted about it. Uh, uh, I, 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 I put it on my Instagram, but uh, I've been, I just got kicked off Instagram. No, uh, why? The trauma, the trauma channel is back. Uh, our, our fans uh, put up a hashtag called uh, Save Trauma's Free Channel, and uh, they rejected our appeal. But uh, when that hashtag started going around, some human being at YouTube must have realized these boys haven't, there's nothing these boys have in their uh, channel of, of 800,000 or 700,000 uh, subscribers that we, uh, uh, that isn't on uh, CNN or, uh, you know, elsewhere. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, that's back. And then we, uh, we, of course, because my partner is, is much, even though my partner keeps a low profile, Michael Erz, he does not care to be out in the public, but he was very upset and he, he migrated all our movies, all our feature length movies off YouTube and they're all uh, added to our uh, streaming service, uh, Troma Now. And the way to subscribe to Troma Now is watch.troma.com. That would be wonderful. Not one of our subscribers has uh, left. Uh, so uh, YouTube reinstated the channel, but Instagram just kicked me off the other day because I, re I shared uh, something that apparently was copywritten. Uh, I didn't know it. Somebody sent it to me and it was very funny. And I thought the whole idea of Instagram is you share stuff and that's how things go viral, but apparently not in this case. You can see Pep Squad on Watch Troma Now. Yes, yes, great. indeed. It's, on, it's definitely on Watch Troma Now. Okay, great. Um, okay, when I, so the story in my book, uh, I used my father's story about when he went to the mining convention Yes. And ended up doing, you know, the whole sideshow thing. And I, I should have talked about going to Cannes and how here we are, you know, at the Troma headquarters in Cannes, at the Carlton or wherever the hell we were. And the characters are in costume and they're marching up and down the croisette. And it's, it's here's the, I mean, you did the model. You, you did the, you're going to do your own thing and everybody's going to pay attention to it. And you weren't worried about, trying to compete necessarily with Sony. Exactly. How yeah. did you know to, how did you, did, was that just instinctive to do that? Yes, uh, indeed. Well, you know, I had a grandfather who actually was in vaudeville. Uh, do you know Ed Wynn, uh, an actor named Ed Wynn? He, he probably he's most famous because he was in one of the Flubber movies with Fred McMurray. But he was a very good uh, uh, theatrical actor and uh, He's in a, a wonderful uh, uh, wrestling movie that was eventually made, remade into uh, one with Anthony Quinn that I think may have won some Oscars. I can't remember the name of it. Great actor. And he's in Twilight Zone several times. But he was a big time guy. And my grandfather sold uh, hat, hat uh, uh, feathers door to door with him and had an act, had a vaudeville act. Uh, and uh, in the same way that I abandoned... Uh, Oliver Stone, just as he was becoming famous, uh, my, my grandfather abandoned uh, Ed Wynn, uh, and uh, just as Ed Wynn was becoming successful. So, uh, you know, there's a little bit of that in my blood. Uh, so, uh, been... yeah, that was kind of just instinctive. But, you know, Can has changed a lot. Uh, when I first got there in 71, 1971, uh, I had sugar cookies in, in 35 millimeter cans. We had enough money to to uh, rent the theater uh, and uh, do a little publicity, but we didn't have money for a hotel. I, I, I slept on the beach. No problem. The cops liked it. The, the tourists liked it. Uh, you know, festivity uh, festival have come from the word festivity. <laughs> uh, festi you know, festive uh, festival, French and English, probably every language. Uh, now... Uh, it got to the point where we literally got policed out. And I made another little documentary uh, about Cannes. We were there two years ago. We were there every year until two years ago. Uh, and uh, it got harder and harder for us to do our circuses, to do our street theater. And um, uh, so I, I made, uh, when we really, when it really got bad, uh, there was a situation where a kid was one of our volunteers. You know, we'd get volunteers. We'd take about six people. Uh, you know, the, well, you saw, we do about the same thing you saw, um, except we had to move our offices because the Carlton Hotel basically kicked us out. So we moved our office into the uh, the Palais. 
and ha and that was where we had the offices. We used to have two places in the Carlton, but they got you know as, as everything went up, the Carlton didn't want the riffraff in there, and the and they didn't want Sergeant Kabuki Man and the Toxic Avenger and and uh, you know. This. I, I I remember my brother dressed up as the Killer Condom. <laughs> so so. Uh, 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 you know, uh, we made a documentary about all that called All the Love You Can, about how we sell movies at Can. But uh, about two years ago, it got really bad. Uh, one of our volunteers was wearing a trauma T-shirt out in front of the, um, the Palais, uh, out in front of the main theater there. And uh, the cops said, no, no, no trauma, no trauma. I mean, we literally couldn't even go on the streets. And uh, the first parade we had, the, co the cops uh, basically... Uh, roughed up our people. I hadn't even gotten there. And uh, they, they took the, uh, they made the guys, uh, they took the camera away from the guys. And I, I, I think they, I don't know if they deleted it, but they put my assistant up against the wall with his hands behind his back, you know, and, you know, it was really very unattractive. And uh, uh, we did a documentary about it. Uh, it was called uh, From Festival to Fascism. So, um, uh, and I haven't been back since. <laughs> well, no, that's terrible. Yeah, it's, it, it, well, it's gotten, I mean, I'm not the only one who says that. Uh, Ed, uh, I have some friends who are big uh, French stars. They say the same thing, that the festival has become much too corporate and, and it's all about the uh, red carpet. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's not the festival that it was. They, and the people of Cannes, the citizens, the police actually like us. But um, if you see all the love you can, which is on trauma now, it shows how, you know, how we do it. Uh, cool. But it changed a lot. Okay, when did, uh, you've got how many movies in the works right now? Well, I don't know what I'm doing next. The, the most recent film is called Hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm, uh, which is my interpretation of The Tempest, my favorite Shakespearean uh, play. But... Um, uh, Mercedes the Muse is writing and direct, has written and directed uh, a movie. It had to go on hiatus, but I think she's in, in uh, California, but she's start, starting up again. Uh, and luckily it's, it's up in the uh, north of uh, Los Angeles. And then um, uh, Heidi Moore has finished her movie uh, called Kill Dolly Kill. Uh, which is um, being in, uh, she's putting on uh, music in, uh, in post-production. And then uh, Liam, uh, Liam Regan, he worked on Return to Newcomb High and Return to Return to Newcomb High. And we distribute one of his movies called uh, uh, My Bloody Banjo. And when I did the master class at Oxford, he, he came, he lives in Sheffield, uh, England. He took a bus eight, eight hours to get to uh, Oxford to attend my uh, two-day master class. Uh, as, and he wrote a really good script called Eating Mrs. Campbell. And, you know, they're all, they've got genre elements, but they're very personal and they're very, you know, they are auteur movies. You can see uh, these are people with strong personalities. We also distribute two of, uh, of uh, Mercedes movies. Uh, uh, one is called Honor Kill. And uh, again, we don't make any money, but uh, Trome is more famous than ever. And people kind of uh, admire us, but we don't make, <laughs> it's been a while since we've actually made any money. Well, I was going to ask you about that and just sort of the evolution of the film industry for the indie person as we know it. I mean, when I met you, DVDs were, they were just beginning, you know, yep. to come around. And so I've seen a huge evolution in the film business, but I imagine that, you know, if you add on your time prior to that, uh, you have seen everything. Uh, almost. Well, pretty much. I mean, when when we started uh, uh, Troma, uh, all it was was theatrical distribution. And uh, then television loosened up a little bit so we could make television versions of our uh, movies uh, because Japan required 95 minutes. So we had all this additional footage. Uh, uh, but uh, And then VHS, uh, the majors did not uh, instead of uh, going with VHS, Valenti was suing because he thought that uh, the uh, MPAA thought that the VHS would open up, uh, would destroy copyright law and, uh, and uh, get, uh, inundate us with uh, ch pornography, which is the same 
uh, argument they use uh, against the uh, net neutrality on the internet. You know, the free and open and diverse internet is the last democratic medium. And uh, uh, thanks to uh, the FCC uh, and uh, the Trump as FCC, uh, the telephone companies who now own uh, Universal and uh, the other one, uh, AT and uh, uh, Warner Brothers, and of course Sony who make uh, earphones, they own uh, Columbia. So now they've got the right, they will have the right to, uh, how do you call it, uh, slow down uh, independent, uh, you know, they'll slow down our uh, content and be able to, uh, they'll throttle us and be able to favor their own content, which they, they, they signed a uh, consent decree that allowed them not to get sued for content on the internet in the same way they don't get sued for, if you and I decide to kill my wife, um, they don't, the, the phone companies are not responsible. They have that same uh, consent decree uh, on the, um, the common carrier, it's called. They're common carriers on the internet. And now, even though they have the common carrier status, they will be allowed to uh, throttle us. And uh, so that's very bad. Well, what kind of advice would you give an aspiring filmmaker fresh out of film school, or maybe they didn't even go to film school and they want to make their movie and they think they're going to spend, you know, a significant amount of money and they're maybe going to make it back? I, I would suggest reading uh, Filmmaking Confidential by Stephen Balderson. And I wrote a book called um, uh, uh, Sell Your Own Damn Movie. Read those because I do talk a lot about file sharing and, and uh, giving away art and uh, all that kind of stuff. But um, uh, right now it's kind of yin and yang, which I did take away from uh, Taoism, which I did take away from my major at college. Uh, the, the idea that uh, the, good, the, yin, the good side, you know, yin and, yin and yang is a dualistic uh, universe. Taoism, Chuangzi. Uh, and, and Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching is kind of my big takeaway. And it's a dualistic universe. You don't have pleasure or pain uh, unless they're together. The uh, oyster gets a piece of sand caught in its uh, anus and it's very painful, but it produces a magnificent, uh, a be perfect pearl and uh, you know, beauty and ugliness uh, are together. So the good thing is that you can, uh, the making of, of movies is democratized. Uh, we, we're distributing the movies I'm producing now are uh, well are under fifty thousand uh, dollars. Two of them are under twenty five thousand dollars, and they're pretty damn good. They've got the, the, the good music, good special effects. They look as good. In fact, we have one on Troma now called Father's Day, uh, made by Astron uh, Six. Uh, it looks it's as good as any Troma movie and uh, any movie that Michael Hers and I have made. It looks as good. The stunts are great. I mean, it's a wonderful film. In a fair world, it ought to be all over Netflix and Amazon. And uh, but uh, you know, I can't get anybody. I, can, I can't even get the 22-year-old suit to uh, to take my phone call. You know, he's the guy who told uh, Fred Zinnemann, uh, "Tell me about yourself." And and he puts his the, the kid puts his feet up on the desk, and Zinnemann says, "You go first. <laughs> and uh, I can't even get those guys to call me. So uh, Father's Day is terrific, and. Um, uh, Michael Hers and I produced it. It's like 25,000 bucks, uh, maybe a little more. And uh, it's beautiful. It's great. So that's the good news. In fact, there were people making movies for $5,000. Uh, right. And they're very good. So, um, uh, well, uh, and it, well, it isn't, I mean, if you know your target market and you can make a movie for that target market, no matter who it is, then you can, you don't have to try to appeal to the everybody else. I, I, at least when I do a movie, I, I, I keep my fans in mind. You know, I don't want to disappoint them, but I also want to do, uh, and I know that I've kept, uh, you know, we do a lot of focus groups uh, when we're making the movie. Not a lot, but uh, for say, hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm. I, I uh, had focus group at NYU, at uh, U USC, uh, at some uh, horror conventions, uh, at, uh, yeah, things like that, where the demographic is kind of my fans. And I know damn well in Citizen Toxie, there was one particular scene where the people just, at once that scene went through, people stopped laughing. But I left the scene in anyway because it was important to me. And the same thing with hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm. The commissioner was one of the producers. And I know there are some scenes in there which he uh, objected to. 
And uh, I kept them in because, again, I, it's about the art. It ain't about uh, making money. And by the way, Karen Black, uh, the late Karen Black, we we, we I, I spent a lot of time with her. She loved you. She, she was so happy with it, your film, right? She was. How was she to work with? Amazing. She was nice, huh? Yeah, she was. She was nice. I think we we got each other. Um, yeah. I mean, my my crews were so small. It was so intimate that you know it was it, it was just it felt like we were just kids playing in the backyard. You know, it was sort of like like that. And um, she was a wonderful person. I, uh, uh, you know, absolutely open minded. Uh, she, she was just great. One of those great people, you know, the one half of 1% of uh, mainstream who are just lovely, wise, talented people. There are tons of people who became big stars who started with trauma. They're great. They're wonderful people, but they only comprised and they moved out to, they knew what they wanted. They wanted they wanted the um, red carpets and the fame and the, if they wanted it, the hookers and the drugs and all that. Uh, and uh, they're great people. But uh, my experience is most of the people in the mainstream are scum of the earth. And I learned that very early in the game. Uh, and um, so that solidified in my head. Uh, stay, uh, stay, at, you know, do what we're doing. And uh, I stopped trying to deal with them. Uh, but I've written I've written seven books. I talk a bit about uh, my experience with the mainstream and a couple of them. I love your uh, all the make your own damn movie, direct your own damn movie, sell your own damn movie. I think those are great. Well, thank you. Um, my memoir uh, it was written in uh, 1994 um, with James Gunn. Uh, he, he really wrote the first book I wrote. Um, but um, in there, I talk a bit about lugging uh, 35 millimeter cans <laughs> in the 102 degree weather at, uh, and uh, to Paramount, to the acquisition department. And, and uh, then they would forget to leave the pass at the, at the gate. And, uh, you know, I'd be standing around while the cars went through and they'd be phoning the incompetent uh, head of, of acquisitions. And, and then I'd park, or they'd put me parking a quarter of a mile away from the office I was to go to and I'd carry the cans with my little bar mitzvah suit on and blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and it just, we never, they, you know, we were not, uh, we weren't like Oliver Stone, you know, we weren't, we weren't uh, nasty enough or uh, Abel Farrar. We didn't, uh, you know, we weren't uh, drugged out all the time or, you know, they're like debutantes with, uh, they like uh, these rough, tough guys. Uh, they're like debutantes with Hell's Angels, you know. Uh, my mother was like that. She uh, hung around with a lot of, she had dogs that would bite you, you know, it was kind of the same thing. You know, they, she always had these dogs that, they were rescue dogs, but she, she would always pick one that just, they'd suddenly go cuckoo and attack you, you know. They, uh, you know, and she loved them. They were like, uh, as I say, the debutante, the Hell's Angel. So, uh, uh, you know, the final countdown, the Kirk Douglas movie, um, I was one of the producers on that because his son, who was the real producer was like 19 years old. So I was the, uh, the one, sort of the uh, adult in the room. And it was just horrible. And it could have been a really good, the son uh, and the writer and the son wrote a terrific script, but they, uh, st the William Morris put together a package uh, with a drunken director and it was just the worst experience. And that, I, I talk about it a lot, the, the, the um, the DVD of the final countdown uh, is, uh, was very successful. And I was interviewed on it and I, I didn't pull any punches. Kirk Douglas is one of my heroes of all time. Uh, and he and I had some rough sledding, but by the end, he, uh, he was very proud of uh, trauma and proud of me. And uh, uh, I'll never forget, uh, we shot most of the movie on the USS Nimitz. It's a, a time travel movie. And uh, my mother came to visit once. Uh, the, 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 Limits, the Nimitz was based in uh, North Car uh, uh, Norfolk, Virginia at the time. And my mother <laughs> and one of her, her <laughs> elegant friends came to visit. And Kirk Douglas was yelling, where's Lloyd? Get me Lloyd, get me Lloyd. <laughs> and, uh, and my mother was so proud of that. <laughs> but uh, that was horrible. He was great. Kirk Douglas, the only movie, the only reason that movie has any validity and is even mediocre is because of Kirk Douglas and Peter Douglas. 
everybody else on it was just uh, trying to, all the crew, the first, the director was a drunk, the, uh, the first crew that he hired were totally incompetent, I had to fire them all. It was a horrible experience. Uh, nobody cared about making a good movie, except for Peter Douglas and uh, Kirk Douglas, and me. So that solidified my uh, uh, desire to stay out of the uh, mainstream. But uh, the people who've come out of trauma, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, the South Park guys, they are absolutely, they're, they're, they're lovely. They're wonderful people. They put me in their movies. They, they talk about trauma. They've been terrific. You know who I'm excited to visit with next week and who I've met a few times is, and I love, is Debbie Rochon. Oh, she's great. She, she, she's one of those people who are genuinely independent. She's yeah. had opportunities to uh, go out west and, and she has preferred to stay uh, independent and, and sincere too. Uh, it's yeah. really interesting. Uh, and um, she had a very bad thing happen to her. It's in one of my books. You know, we have three rules of production and I would tell this to young filmmakers, you know, it's only a movie. So the three rules of trauma production, uh, safety to humans, safety to people's property, and then in much smaller writing, make a good movie. And uh, when I do, when I make a movie, I, I require the art department uh, to put uh, to put this uh, rules in a poster form and make it nice so they see we care about it and put them all over the uh, pre-production, wherever we are in pre-production, where and uh, uh, all the locations on the trucks, on the dogs, on the craft service table, in the bathrooms, uh, uh, everywhere. It's, and even on the trauma building, those signs are, are there to because young people, uh, you know, they're very enthusiastic and they, some, they, wouldn't, they don't wear rubber sole shoes, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, it's dangerous making a movie. The other countries, uh, Canada and Europe, have a, a, a lot more open-mindedness. They, they encourage their independent filmmakers. Uh, they give uh, the locals, even horror films uh, or Mutant Blast, they give money to, and then, the theaters are required, if it's a Portuguese made movie, the theaters are required to show it. So uh, they brought us over, the distributor brought the commissioner and me over to uh, Portugal to promote uh, 15 theaters and 13 of them got held over. We, we were lucky to get, uh, you know, if, if, if I direct a movie, we get about 200 theaters, but most of them other than New York and LA are a one weekend or a midnight show or you know, a week would be the maximum. Uh, whereas in Portugal, if you're, uh, and Canada is the same. Uh, if you're a local filmmaker, you get, uh, you get money from the government, um, even if it's a, a trauma movie. And um, you get, you know, if it's, if it's a, a native Canadian, and that's true all over Europe, but uh, not in this country. The U.S. government basically subsidizes the, uh, the mega conglomerates with the uh, tax benefits and uh, and things like that. They don't do anything for the independent filmmaker. You have free speech in the United States as long as you don't say anything. Lloyd Kaufman is a true maverick. Troma's Blu-rays, DVDs, books, t-shirts, and movie merchandise can be purchased at www.tromadirect.com. All of Troma's classic features, including my film, Pep Squad, can be viewed at watch.troma.com. Tune in next time for more Filmmaking Confidential. It is totally free to subscribe, and when you subscribe, you'll get upcoming new episodes automatically, and you'll have free access to all our past shows. The Filmmaking Confidential podcast is a production of Dekanga Audio and produced by myself and Ella Spencer. Our theme music is composed by Kevin Novrobles. For more of the Filmmaking Confidential podcast, head over to filmmakingconfidential.com. If you have a question about filmmaking you'd like answered on the podcast, send me an email using the contact form on the website. To learn more of my filmmaking secrets, be sure to pick up a copy of the book, Filmmaking Confidential, available on Audible, paperback, and ebook, wherever books are sold. I'm Steve Balderson. Thanks for listening and sharing the word. Until next time, keep making, keep doing, keep going. <laughs>